All right, are we ready to get started here? Everybody have a good lunch? My name is Jill Shavina Stoddart. I am part of the EC2 service team and I manage our Windows business. Uh, today I have with me from AWS, Lance Spratt, who is our Microsoft licensing expert. And I'm pleased to have with me from Infor, our customer, uh, Richard Sharp, who is uh, responsible for many databases there. So today's session, we're gonna talk about how you can bring your Microsoft applications to AWS and save a lot of money. And I forgot my clicker. So what I'm gonna start with today is giving you an overview of how do are the different licensing types on AWS. And then uh, Richard is going to talk to you about how does he make those choices of when to use AWS licenses and when to bring his own licenses and how he's been saving a lot of money by making those right choices. And then at the end, I'll talk about a few more ways for you to think about how to optimize licensing on AWS. What we're not gonna cover in depth here is if you happen to be a, a somebody who has your own service provider licensing agreement or your own, you use a SPLA today from Microsoft, we won't be focusing on those licensing rules on AWS. If you have that, this gentleman here is your man and we'll be happy to, uh, Lance will be happy to answer any questions there. Um, I'll mention briefly a few times about uh, end user computing licenses, uh, but is, we're not gonna cover in depth here licensing for the desktop or the productivity software. Um, again, Lance and I and a lot of other folks, we manage our email here, Microsoft at Amazon.com, really easy. If you have any questions whatsoever, just let us know. So I wanna cover a little bit of uh, terminology, so I'm hoping that during today's talk, we're gonna, I'm gonna start assuming you don't know a lot, I'm sure most of you do, but I wanna make sure everybody has a common understanding. On-premises, when you license Microsoft uh, applications and operating systems, it's really tied to the server. So um, the licensing is assigned to that physical server and you really have to know about the sockets or physical cores. The traditional way to think about licensing in a multi-tenant infrastructure in the cloud where you have multiple customers sharing the server, um, Microsoft provides uh, for partners like AWS. We are a gold partner of Microsoft and we fulfill, um, uh, we offer licensing um, for Microsoft applications as well as we'll talk about how you can bring your own licenses to AWS. So we're gonna go over, this is kind of our roadmap for my section of the discussion today, talk about what, how we call, um, when you buy your licenses for Microsoft through us, we call those license included instances. And then we'll talk about options for bringing your own Microsoft licenses. So let's start with the license included instances. Um, the big advantage here is of course, you are getting, you're not paying upfront uh, for acquiring those licenses from Microsoft. You're paying as you go and you can get it through all of our pricing mechanisms, different pricing options of on-demand, reserved instances, and we even offer it uh, with spot instances. And we see a lot of that usage with spot, some um, high performance computing, gaming applications are really taking advantage of spot for Windows. Another nice advantage when you are using the license included instances, be it on EC2 or on RDS, is that AWS is managing that image for you. You don't have to do that. Um, when you uh, get uh, Microsoft applications through AWS, we offer you a number of different options going back for, to 2003 for Windows and 2004 for SQL Server. Um, I think one of the nice things here too is uh, you don't have to worry about when we come out with, you know, we just came out with SQL Server 2017. If you're on an older version, you wanna switch over, you're not gonna have to pay an upgrade fee for that. And finally, I think uh, the next two items here, I think are some, probably some of your favorite things of 
how do I reduce, you know, you might be coming up for re renewal on your Microsoft Enterprise Agreement, um, and you want to look for ways to not have to make that next three-year commitment um, for even a larger sum of money, or not go through audits and true-ups. By switching over to getting your licenses uh, on a pay-as-you-go basis from AWS, uh, you don't have to do that anymore. So some of those options that I just mentioned, Windows Server, again, these are images that we provide and maintain going back from 2003 to 2016. When you get uh, that AMI image, that Amazon machine image from us, um, you also get the two remote desktop services connections, and then we can also talk about how, if you actually need more RDS licenses, you can bring those through license mobility, and we'll talk about that later. SQL Server, again, goes back to 2005, and we recently um, launched on October 4th, two days after the GA of SQL Server um, by Microsoft for 2017. We provided those images as well. And in case, if you are an RDS user, we now have uh, SQL Server 2017 on RDS. We also have, we start with a web, the Web Editions SQL Server standard, and a year ago, we expanded uh, to all of our regions the availability of SQL Server Enterprise Edition. Again, with SQL Server, you do not need any to buy any extra or worry about client access licenses. When you get those from AWS, those are included. Um, I know that there has been a lot of announcements leading up to reInvent and here at reInvent. You may have missed that um, our newest X1E instance. I'm sure many of you, how many of you in here are responsible for SQL Server? A lot of SQL Server users, okay. So one of the things, you know, everybody likes to have really memory intensive instances for SQL Server. Um, this one is uh, 32 um, gigabits to one CPU ratio, really nice. Um, one of the ways that I think is gonna be really useful, SQL Server Standard Edition, as of 2014, allows you to go to a maximum of 128 gigabytes memory. Um, so this, this instance here, I get to use my spotter, I've been practicing that. <laughs> um, has a really nice, that minimum of four vCPUs, which you always have to have for SQL Server, um, and the 120 gigabyte. The really nice thing now with the X1E instance is that by maximizing, going for that maximum size on the memory to the four vCPUs, you're gonna reduce your total cost of that instance by 60% for the SQL Server standard. Big savings. Again, for SQL Server Enterprise Edition, if you want to have, like, I think this is a sweet spot for many users, is 244 gigabytes of memory to the eight vCPU, really nice 68% savings. Okay, so I covered license included, ran quickly through a lot of ways uh, to use that as a new way to save some money. Now we're gonna talk about bringing your own licenses. Um, when we, you know, many of you are probably looking at migrating, doing maybe a lift and shift uh, of a lot of older applications from on-premises to AWS. And one of the considerations there is, did I just invest a lot in um, an enterprise agreement maybe and spent a lot on licenses? So I've spent all that money. By bringing these licenses to AWS, uh, you can now leverage those investments here. You also don't have to worry about, okay, I bought this, I might not, you know, maybe I don't, I want to use this, but uh, I'm on an older version of SQL Server or Windows. Well, you can bring those as long, uh, as, as well without having to worry about an upgrade path. And of course, just bringing those images straight over to AWS is a nice time-saving feature. So, before I dive into how to do the licensing, I want to do a quick review of the different tenancies and what the differences are. And then I'll show you how that applies to licensing as we go through this. Default tenancy is I'm sure what most of you, anybody who's using EC2 is already familiar with, multiple uh, customers on one, uh, on one server. So this is your multi-tenant infrastructure. We at AWS decide which of uh, where, when you launch an instance, we're gonna decide what host to place that on within the availability zone that you choose. You are paying per instance, of course. 
We also offer dedicated instances. A dedicated instance means that you are going to be, we're guaranteeing that you're gonna be the only customer, more specifically, the only AWS account on that host. With a dedicated instance, your um, AWS is going to control what host we put that on, as long as it's a host that only is being used by your account. The way you pay for this is per instance on that, uh, it's still paying per instance, but the one catch here is that um, for every, it's a $2 an hour fee for using dedicated instances within the region. So if you are launching in multiple availability zones, dedicated instances, you have a one time, so one per the whole region per hour fee. So dedicated hosts, these are different in some ways than a dedicated instance. The dedicated host is again single tenant, so it has that in common with the dedicated instance. But the difference here is that this, now you have visibility down to the physical hardware. You control, you're owning that, that hardware for the time you have it allocated. So you're paying per host for the entire host per hour. And you can control when you launch an instance, you tell it which host to place it on. So you are in control. And of course, this is gonna have um, some impl implications for licensing. So let's talk about the licensing now on default tenancy. Licensing on default tenancy from Microsoft applications, when you wanna bring your own licenses, you need to have license mobility. And of course, this is a benefit of Microsoft Software Assurance. Um, with the license mobility, you can bring um, both per core licensing, so, so for example, SQL servers license uh, per core, or you can do per user licensing, such as remote desktop services. What you can't do on, on, with license mobility is not applicable for your OS. So license mobility, uh, you cannot use that with um, on the default instances because it's multi-tenant um, infrastructure. So we'll go through now, how do you use that? So when you bring your own, um, because we can't bring your own Windows Server licenses, you're gonna get licenses from AWS, so the AWS license included on me, and then bring your own uh, applica Microsoft application. So commonly, yeah, I would say the number one case that we see people using this for is SQL Server. They're bring, you're bringing your own licenses for that. I've listed up here some of the other applications, um, but again, anything that has that license mobility, but you cannot bring Windows Server Windows Desktop or Microsoft Office licenses to those default instances. So again, you're gonna bring, start with the license included instance and then bring um, in your own software for the Microsoft application. Okay, you say, I remember last month with SQL Server 2017, we started to offer uh, that on Linux. So what about Linux? So with, um, you can, for with, if you're gonna use SQL Server 2017 on Linux, you can either start with an AWS AMI or use your own Linux AMI and bring that SQL Server 2017 as long as you have that license mobility benefit. You can bring those to that multi-tenant infrastructure. So how do you pay for, how do you think about that SQL Server with license mobility? SQL Server is licensed per physical core. So I've copied here a small section um, and I put the link, as you might probably already know if you've been here at reInvent all week, all of our presentations are gonna be on YouTube and all of these slides will be on SlideShare. So I've got here the link to our page where you can, our, our AWS website, where you can see all of our instance types and how many hardware threads or vCPUs are used in those instance types. Because for SQL Server, you are going to need to license the number of vCPUs that you have allocated. Keep in mind that Microsoft licensing rules are that you always have to pay for a minimum of four cores. So in our language, that's four vCPUs. If you are using, uh, if you are bringing SQL Server with license mobility, you also have the um, 
the, the passive node benefits here. So if that is all passive, then you don't have to pay for that second node. Richard will talk a lot more about this when he goes through how he's using BYOL in his environment. Now, if um, maybe some of you were at Sandy Carter's uh, talk early this morning where she announced seven new features for our enterprise workloads. One of them, and a key one I think is gonna be really interesting for some people who are using SQL Server, is a new feature we'll be coming out with shortly called Optimize CPU. This is going to allow you at the instance level for each instance to define how, what the maximum number of vCPUs you want to be visible in your instance. Um, of course, this is gonna have benefits for you if you wanna control those number of vCPUs you're paying for for SQL Server. This feature will also allow you if you have applications for performance reasons where you do not want to use the Intel hyper-threading technology. Okay, let's move on now to dedicated tenancy, and we'll start first with the dedicated instance, which, again, just really quickly here, um, that is you're paying per instance for that dedicated tenancy. So you have it all to yourself, but you're paying per instance. So why, are you want, why would you want to use a dedicated instance? Some of the common use cases are you want to bring your own license for uh, a Microsoft application, but you, have, you do not have software assurance current on that license. You can, if you're on a dedicated infrastructure, Microsoft allows you to bring those applications, such as SQL Server, onto a dedicated instance. Another option here is, this is where, again, because you're not sharing that instance on the hardware with other customers, you can use your desktop OS and Microsoft Office on dedicated instance. The one time on dedicated instance when you can actually bring your own SQL, uh, excuse me, Windows Server license is if you have MSDN licensing. Now, because uh, if you recall when I introduced what a dedicated instance is, we, Amazon is taking care of the placement. You are not controlling which of the dedicated, uh, which of the hosts that instance is being launched on. So because of that, <clears throat> you cannot bring your own Windows Server license. So similar to um, using the license mobility benefit on the default tenancy, you're gonna start, for a dedicated instance, you're gonna, bring, you're gonna use a Amazon machine image, license included for Windows Server, and then bring your Microsoft application with or without software assurance. Finally, let's cover here dedicated hosts. Again, dedicated host means you have full control over this host. You are deciding the placement and you have visibility to the socket and cores. The use case for this is, of course, is that you're getting this host without the OS, the Windows Server charge included. And now this is the type of instance where you can bring your own Windows Server licenses to this. Another benefit here, and again, this is where Richard will spend a lot of time talking about, is you can really take advantage if you have a lot of Windows Server Data Center Edition licenses and SQL Server Enterprise Edition, you now can use that to license the entire host. You also have the option, because you have visibility to the socket and cores and control the placement on the physical host, to license um, by physical core. So what does this mean? Again, this is a little a snippet of our dedicated host pricing page. And in this, the example I have highlighted here, with a C4 instance, you have 20 physical cores. When you um, allocate this dedicated host, then you're gonna decide what size of instances you're gonna use. So for example, in this case, you have um, eight, if you're gonna use an extra large instance size, you have eight instances that you're getting on that dedicated host. With Windows Server Data Center Edition now, you are licensing, you can take advantage, all eight of those instances get the benefit of your Data Center Edition. The same for SQL Server Enterprise Edition gets the benefit of all of those instances. Now, what if 
you want to bring over um, some Windows Standard uh, licenses. In that case, Windows Standard allows you two instances um, uh, per license. So if you were to get this C4 uh, XL dedicated host, that means you would bring over four Windows Standard licenses to use all eight of those instances. Uh, for SQL Server Standard Edition, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So you're going to bring, if you want to, uh, maybe you're not going to use right away all eight of those instances. Maybe you're only going to use six. So in that case, you would just bring over with SQL Server Standard six, in, uh, six licenses. So how do you actually do this, bring your licenses to the dedicated hosts? Uh, Richard is going to cover some, some of these details uh, when he talks about his operations. Um, but the other, the other thing I want to point to here is that we have a great video demo for those of you who actually want to walk through and see how in PowerShell you would do this. The first thing that you will do just at a high level though is you're going to import your VM using our VM import tool. And then uh, the next step is you may, you, uh, we offer the AWS config service. That will help you keep track of your license usage. The next step is you actually allocate a host. And then after you allocate the dedicated host, you can start launching instances. And recall that then you're going to tell it which host to go on to. So that's a very high level summary. Um, but again, if you want to, if you're testing this out for yourself, I encourage you to watch the video demo when you're home. So just recapping the three types of uh, licensing that we have um, on default, ten on the default tenancy, you either can get everything from us, uh, Windows Server and SQL Server, or you can just use SQL, uh, Windows Server and bring your own licenses under license mobility. Dedicated instance is similar to the default. The difference here is you can bring your Microsoft applications without uh, software assurance. The other use cases that are enabled on dedicated instances that are not on default are bringing Windows Server under MSDN. And you can also, on a dedicated instance, use your um, Windows Desktop OS and Microsoft Office. Dedicated host does not have Windows uh, Amazon provided Windows and SQL Server AMIs. Dedicated host is where the place where you're going to bring your licenses over and is a great place when you have Windows Server Data Center Edition and SQL Server Enterprise Edition. So I covered, uh, you know, maybe for some of you, you already had all this. Um, this was the whole theoretical. Now what's more important is how do I choose? and how do I save money using these different options? And for that, I'm going to have Richard come up and, and tell you about his case. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Jill. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks. I'm Richard Sharp with Enforce Software. We're uh, an enterprise software provider, uh, technology partner for more than 90,000 organizations worldwide. Um, we've got 16,000 people scattered around the world writing software and, and trying to solve enterprise-grade problems. Uh, working with people like you, uh, we've got we've got uh, offerings in most tiers of, of major vertical markets and, and several offerings outside that. Love to talk to you. If, uh, hop over to Infor.com if any of that interests you. I actually run the database tier uh, in Infor's public cloud and want to talk to you about that um, and, and what we found after we started working with some of these these options that Jill's been talking to you about. So on the screen right now is a kind of a generic. Uh, footprint of, a, of, a, of an application, right? So just kind of pointing out a few things and get us in, in the mindset here. Um, oops, not that one. There we go. On the front end here, you might have Route 53 uh, directing customers into your website. Um, you might be streaming stuff out of, the, out of S3, some kind of static content whenever. Um, you might be coming back through an ELB into an auto-scaling group here um, uh, and serving up more dynamic content. Behind that, you might have another ELB going into a, uh, an auto scale group for your web tier, or app tier, sorry. <clears throat> and then finally, in the back, the, the important stuff, the, the, the heartbeat of your kingdom, um, the database. So I'm pointing all this out because there's, there's a few things here that, that need bearing, uh, uh, saying out loud, especially if we're thinking about bringing Windows into the cloud environment, right? 
Linux guys have this down automatically. They think about coding and scripting and programming stuff. And, and one of the things I want to emphasize is that w when you start to lay this out with Windows, you should be thinking the same. All that stuff should be laid out with code. It's no different. Um, uh, some of the old timers still like the pointy clicky stuff, and there, there's just not enough uh, time, time in the day to do that at, at scale. So as, as I start to look at, the, at this stuff and think about code spitting these pieces out, then some of the options Jill's talking about suddenly make sense, right? Where, and where would I take advantage of that in that picture? Which is really limited by your creativity, but just to, just to throw a few, few ideas out, um, you, you might find that back here in your app tier, you've got um, some core things that aren't scaling up and down. Scaling up and down, you're not gonna be able to get into uh, the dedicated host, it's not gonna work out. But you might have stuff that's out there static, like if you've blown a thousand of these bubbles out and there's AD in every single piece of it, that AD might be a great spot to consolidate up, run on dedicated hosts. Um, there's nothing that prevents you from having the instances in your dedicated hosts on separate VPCs, right, to, to support this type of model. Um, there's other examples hidden in here. It's, it's based on your creativity. I'm gonna talk about the very back part back here, the database, because they're, they're, they're what I know and love and, and do a lot of. <clears throat> the big question I wanna leave you with there, though, is, is what parts could you use? Um, and along with the thought that this all really needs to be infrastructure as code, right? Uh, get, get out of the, 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 the idea that you're gonna spend hours debugging Windows and trying to figure out what, uh, make it work, throw that thing away and make another one, right? Have that all bit code-based. All right, two big licensing paths. For most of us coming out of physical data centers or colos, we've got a pretty substantial uh, investment in licensing already. That first year is really expensive, as you guys know. You start uh, purchasing hundreds of cores of, of licenses for your Microsoft products. You can spend a lot of money that first year. Subsequent years, however, when you're under maintenance and support, a lot less money. So, right, so th that's the first thought when you think about shifting a workload up to the cloud. Don't throw away your existing investment, right? Keep it, move it up using these options uh, to, to keep saving money because you're already on the cheap part of, the, the part of that expense. However, there is that second part. Right? Even after you get your workload shifted up into the cloud, most of us are hoping to stay in business year after year. So one of two things is gonna happen. You're either gonna get a new workload you need to, to, to put out there or, or your existing workloads are gonna grow org organically and you're gonna need to pick up new licensing. So with that thought in mind, we're, we're gonna look at both of them and how we might calculate out and see if we can save money doing this. <clears throat> so real quick, just to kind of get the ideas in our head again, stealing one of Jill's slides shamelessly. On the left is the default tenancy. Uh, maybe I'm customer A and I've got this default, uh, this uh, one instance running in there. It's got four virtual CPUs. My run rate on that guy has pricing from the Microsoft four vCPUs built in. Right, so I'm paying for it day in, day out for the entire time I'm running it. On the right, the dedicated host, so I buy that guy, it's mine. The entire thing is mine. I choose what to put on there. I'm licensing at that level. I'm using dedicated hosts. The, the, the two things that Jill mentioned that were the enablers of this for me were Windows Data Center and SQL Server Enterprise. Because I can actually, as I get on the dedicated host, I can see my sockets, I can see my cores. That's what I can report out, that's what I can license against. All right, so let's, let's grab a real example, R4 machines. I love these things. Sweet machine for running a database load on. They've got the, the eight to one ratio for, for uh, RAM to CPU, um, which works for, for most common databases on the market today. Uh, they've got great throughput to the EBS in the background. They've got fast processors, really nice machine. So I wanna point out the 4X large and get the number in your head, right? 16 vCPUs. R4 4X large is a great machine for running databases on them. I'll, I'll run 300, 300, 400 databases on a machine like that. Um, 16 VP CPU, so let's keep that in mind. Next, I'm gonna steal a line out of Jill's chart, right? So I'm gonna go buy a dedicated host, an R4, to run my load on. And so what I see here is, is I'm looking at my, my R4 dedicated host. First thing I see is that it's got two sockets and 36 physical cores, right? So from the Windows side, depending on whether you're, you're, you're still working on your old EA or, or you've re-upped, you're either, you're either licensing by, uh, by the two sockets or the 36 physical cores. Same with SQL Server, you're going after the 36 cores. And what I see is, here we go, if I'm gonna load this thing up with four X larges, I'm gonna fit four on this machine. Remember there were 16 vCPUs on those. So when I start to build my model out, that's what I wanna remember. <clears throat> are those numbers, so here we go. 
I'm going to walk you through the process. It turns out that all our, our licensing numbers, right, they're all a little bit different because we all negotiate the best we can with Microsoft. But let's just talk out what this would look like. In R4, I've got 36 physical cores, and it would hold four of those machines. And I'm paying basically the Linux run cost for the dedicated host itself, which is pretty cheap because there's no built-in pricing for anything Microsoft. I'm then bringing my own license for 36 cores of Windows, 36 cores of SQL Server, and so I'm adding that up. Okay? So that's on, that's on one part of my spreadsheet. I write those numbers down. And what I want to compare that to is the cost of four R4 4X larges okay, running, running Windows and SQL Enterprise and look at the two together, right? And I find I'm paying licensing on 64, um, 64 CPUs. So at least at, at the first blush, it would seem like I've got a 36 to 64 advantage right, off, right out of the gate walking out, right? Not quite half. I just save half my money by moving this way. But it turns out it's a little bit better, and here's why. Remember that first year when I bought, that was where most of my money went out. The subsequent years, I'm paying support and maintenance. So when I lay this cost out, what I really want in my left-hand column when I'm calculating out my dedicated host is my support that I'm paying, which is less per year. Okay. Now, uh, it, it, let's mention RIs real quick. Hopefully, most of you are using RIs for your workloads, right? Dedicated hosts have a similar feature. It's called host reservations. It does the same type of thing that RIs do for default instances. So if you use those, put it on both sides of your spreadsheet. Be consistent. Either apply it or don't. Okay? And what you're going to find is uh, your, your numbers will vary slightly based on your numbers. This is 70% off for us. Right? It's a lot of money off. It's worth doing. It makes it worth the hassle of doing this. And suddenly what becomes the driving factor is, is can I fill that host? How many machines do I need to spin up? And how, how full can I get these things? Because 70% off is fantastic. <clears throat> well, what if I don't own the licenses already and I'm, I'm having to buy, you know, my, 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 uh, my footprint has grown organically or I'm, I'm deploying a new workload and I find I've got to to buy some licenses. So here's where I find out that Amazon, the run rate on those default instances is actually pretty competitive, right? If I were to, to do the spreadsheet with the cost of purchasing my licenses for one year, I'd find that I'm actually probably spending more money buying licenses, maybe 20% more. The trick is to do it over two years, right? Because remember, your second year, you're paying maintenance and support only, and it's a lot less money. So run your spreadsheet for two years. Your default instances for two years versus the cost of you buying the first year and support and maintenance the second year. And what you're going to find is, is that you probably save 20% at that point over two years. And it keeps rising because the subsequent years are so much cheaper. So after three years, 37%, rising to 50, 55, et cetera. You start saving more and more money as you go. <clears throat> and we're all hoping to be in business for more than one year, right? So it's, it's a, a fair way to look at the entire thing. All right, those are pretty good numbers. It, 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 just right there, if I said nothing else, I'd say go home and, and sharpen your pencil, do a spreadsheet, and figure out it, it, your numbers should be somewhat similar, and figure out how you can start deploying this stuff, because it, it, it's, a, it's a big savings. But what else, can I, what else can I do and take advantage of? Well, let's talk HA for databases. Um, and I, I'm using HA here and, and, and not DR. Let me just throw that out real quick. Hopefully, DR isn't in your vocabulary anymore, right? It has no business, that, that, that term has no business being in the cloud. What I want to do is I want to set, uh, set all, that, all the tiers of my application up, scattered across AZs. Each AZ is going to be in a different physical data center with some amount of uh, geographical miles between it. Um, I, I want all my tiers, including database, sprinkled across AZs so that I've got protection from all normal disasters, you know, whatever a normal disaster is, right? A, a tornado ripping through a building, a, a plane crash, a, you know, pick your favorite disaster, reasonable size disaster. Um, Suddenly, I can survive that, right? So what does that look like? Well, SQL Server Enterprise has support for always-on availability groups. So what you do is you, you put a host in each AZ, tie your nodes together with an availability group with synchronous commit. I can get away with synchronous commit because uh, in Amazon, the, the latency between AZs is very low. They advertise less than two milliseconds. I routinely measure under one. It's very fast. Most of my workloads do just fine under synchronous commit across those AZs. They're running in a, in a uh, failover cluster, so the, the cluster is watching and automatically bringing one up. So suddenly, world, uh, life got easy for me. I can do maintenance on one node, fail over to it, do, do maintenance on the other node, and never go down, right? I'm, al I'm always on at this point. I got built-in protection from reasonable-sized disasters. Um, 
I got a few other things for free. Um, always on under the hood is checking pages, right? So if you've got, if you've got a, a problem in the database engine, you had some data corruption, it's automatically pulling the other nodes, doing data correction, shipping across, right? So you got some stuff built in for free. And if all else fails, if one of those things happens that, that we really don't want to talk about and the entire East Coast goes down, it, well, probably got bigger problems than worrying about your workload at that exact moment, but you, you come back up from, from your snapshots that you took your backups on uh, when, when it becomes available again. All right, so here's the big decision point if you're going to do this type of, of, of architecture, is do you allow any kind of interesting workload on the second node? Interesting workload could be anything taking backups, uh, ETL extractions for a data lake, um, uh, read-only for reports, whatever you're doing with it. If the answer is no, if it's really going to be a passive node, then under enterprise, I don't have to pay for that passive node. No, it does need to truly be passive, and then I don't pay for it. Now, I still pay for Windows. I pay for all nodes. So what does that look like? Well, as I'm thinking about it, right on the left side, I've got you know, both sides. I'm, I'm paying for Windows, and in my active node, I'm paying for SQL, but that guy over there as I'm laying out my spreadsheet, that one of my four pieces, my four major dollar pieces, just became free. So that fractional advantage we were looking at earlier just tipped in my favor, right? For me, it just went to 80%. So then the question becomes is why would I do anything other than run HA in the cloud, right? 80% off is a, good, is, a, is a good discount for running. It gives me all those other advantages, uh, the things. What about failovers? Well, you've got 90 days to move back onto your normal node. Um, plenty of time. Most of us have monthly maintenance windows for, for stuff. And remember, you're on, always on, so you just fail over when you're ready. You've got plenty of time to do that. All right. I'll mention something briefly. Because um, your, your creativity, as soon as you get this type of architecture set up, then your, your creative guys will start coming up with more plans for, for you to do. Um, so like in this example, somebody thought up, hey, let's get a, an asynchronous commit over to another region and get ourselves some, some additional capability. And that, that's all great. Um, I do want to point out that the passive second node really is passive second node. It doesn't matter how many, how many nodes you put in your cluster, you're going to get exactly one free SQL server. You're not going to get more. Um, so factor that into your calculations. All right, what does this look like to set up and run? Well, the first thing you realize is you gotta create your own army, right? So we tapped a guy on the shoulder, sent him off. He came back two weeks later, looking a little battered, but he was smiling and had an army in his hand. Um, he'd figured out how to use VM Workstation um, to, to create something and then export it. We got VM Import to bring it up into the cloud and we're running it. And so immediately on the heels of that, we suddenly realized that, wow, that's our army. That, that's our army. Right? So unlike uh, being able to run a default instance where it comes up and Windows is patched, your PV driver is current, your EC2 config is current, we own that all of a sudden. So we tapped a second guy on the shoulder, uh, had him shadow the first, and they started maintaining images every month, and then we, we didn't allow them to go to lunch together in the same car. Um, but two guys part-time, right? So not, not undoable. A few hours a month, and it's up and going. All right. What else? Well, as we started going through the year, we've, we've, we've figured out some things. Host reservations need planning, much like uh, reserved instances need some planning, right? If, if you don't plan it out and, and maintain what you're doing, you're going to lose your, your TCO on your, on your deployment. And an additional gotcha here is that the host reservation is tied to a particular host. So what that means is you've got to stand up a host and then apply for the purchase of the reservation on it. So if you're in a big, if you're in a big corporation and your purchasing takes a little bit of time, you may have some amount of days going through where you're, you're burning the higher run rate before your purchase gets through and the reservation gets put back on it. Um, you also may find yourself in a position where you've emptied a host out and it's still got the reservation on it and you can't get rid of the host because the reservation's on it but you're not actually taking advantage of the reservation. And you can't move the reservations yourself. You've got to reach out to your Amazon contacts and, and email them and ask them, please move this from here to there. And, uh, since the other one had to be up and running on it, you're back in that boat. If you had to create something and it's getting loaded up on a higher, higher, higher hourly run rate while you're waiting for Amazon to move the reservation over, right? So we're, we're hoping, we're, we're talking to some of these fine folks, hoping for some improvements in this area, but it's something to, to, to note, to, to manage. It'll come back to haunt you after you've been in about a year. We were, we were one year in, um, and when it came time to re-up our R3 reservations, we realized that our 4s were out and they were really cool. Um, and we had to repeat everything I just said, right? It's, except that at that point it was at scale, right? Dozens and dozens of hosts and having to stop and manage. Um, so plan your stuff out carefully. 
Uh, it takes a little bit of work, right? There, there's not a great way to track this. EC2 config and things like that can help you with, with tracking this stuff. Um, which gets you around uh, a couple of the next, the, the next major points here, right? To, to really call a host active or passive and take advantage of those pricings, everything on that host had to be active or everything on that host had to be passive. So if I've got 100 of these dedicated hosts sitting out there, I need to make sure that I put all my active loads on one and, and passive loads on another. And I don't have tagging yet, so this is something I'm tracking myself whether I'm, I'm doing it via tools I made or, or I'm doing EC, EC Amazon config, sorry. Um, but I'm tracking it somehow, so take note, right? Otherwise, you're going to be eking out that uh, uh, stuff. Another one, uh, maintenance events, right? We all usually subscribe to the maintenance events on, for our instances, so we know, hey, Amazon's detected degraded hardware under your instance, and we recommend that uh, you, know, you reboot or move over onto, onto something else. Or, uh, we're going to be doing maintenance on your hardware uh, in three weeks, so please be prepared for that outage or, or, or move off ahead of time. Well, they don't tell us that at the host level. They tell us that at the instance level. So when you're running thousands of these things, you need something to kind of correspond and look and think about the messages that are coming to you. Again, these are all things that uh, these guys have been great to partner with, and, and we're, we're looking forward to maybe some improvements in this area. Meanwhile, plan it out for you. So just kind of summing that out again, right? Um, and kind of summed up in the, the phrase of, why aren't you doing this yet? You already own your license, even just single node, 70% off the run rate. And, and Amazon's run rate is competitive. We talked about that earlier, but 70% off of it. 80% if you can figure out how to do a passive node in SQL Server. Purchasing new licenses, still saving 20% over two years, which is good money. And it keeps climbing after that. So to kind of summarize all that up, there, there's some workloads that are better suited uh, than others on this. But it's worth taking a little time and getting creative to figure it out, um, because there's a lot of work there. It takes some planning and some work, uh, but it's worth it for the money that we're talking about. Uh, so that's all I've got, Jill. I'm going to hand this back over to you. Great. Well, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. uh, before you go, Richard, I'm curious. Uh, how many databases do you manage? Uh, about 100,000. 100,000. OK. How many people can beat that here? Anybody got more than 100,000? OK. How many EC2 instances are those across? 3,000. 3,000. Can anybody beat that? Anybody got more than 3,000? All right. <laughs> How many dedicated hosts? Uh, somewhere in 200, maybe. Great. Mm -hmm. So that's an impressive scale. How long have you been doing that? Uh, we've, been, we've been on the dedicated hosts since they came out. We were an early adopter of them. So I've been in production on them for 18 months now. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate that. And of course, we're going to, in a couple minutes, take questions. So if anybody has questions for Richard or Lance, myself, would be happy to answer that. So let's talk about a few other ways that you can uh, work on optimizing your licensing costs. The first thing I want to share with you uh, is uh, we have started to work with our AWS competency, Microsoft competency partners to offer a Microsoft Workloads optimization proof of concept. Software One, uh, some, many of you might buy, uh, do your uh, Microsoft Enterprise Agreement renewals through Software One, a great uh, competency partner of ours, um, is the first one that's offering this. And so what this is, this offering will, uh, the first step is that they will go through and do a discovery um, and analyze uh, all of your software licensing assets that you have and how you're utilizing those today on premises or wherever you're using those. Um, and so they're going to look at that, and they're, again, an AWS competency partner, so they understand then how can you maximize those existing licensing assets in AWS and kind of take a lot of the things that Richard and I both talked about, about where do you want to maybe bring those existing licenses over to AWS and where in your architecture do you want to use the license included instances. And then in this POC, they'll also help you think about how do you design for the future? SQL Server is now on Linux. Maybe there's options of taking some of these components to open source and further reducing that. And they do this all as part um, leading up to your enterprise agreement renewal so that when you go into that next three-year agreement, you have this future planned out. And maybe you can actually, instead of growing your enterprise agreement commitment, reduce it, at least for some of these components. 
Um, another is, as far as it, we were discussing, and I think, you know, Richard and I had talked about some of this as well. You have a lot of people, you know, a lot of different people have been developing on that SQL Server, and maybe not all of that data. I mean, can you talk about a couple cases you've seen of where some of that is in databases and might not need to be there? Maybe on S3 it could be on? Yeah, we didn't realize this in time when we were migrating up to the cloud. We had a lot of legacy workloads we were moving up to. Uh -huh. um, and it turned out that, that, that for quite a while through the 90s and the aughts that uh, people were getting happy with databases, throwing anything in there. Yeah. Um, they had no business being in an ACID compliant database, right? That, that is arguably the most expensive tier of any application mm -hmm. that's deployed. Um, and it really needs to be down to that transactional data. Um, yeah. And, and so the one thing we realized in retrospect is that that was our time. When we were planning out to move to the cloud, that was our time. We had all the people involved mm -hmm. in the legacy app thinking and talking. That would have been our time to have split off. Because once we got in the cloud, they dissipated again. It was suddenly became a much harder, harder conversation. To, yeah. Yep. So one of the things that uh, we've announced this week is with our AWS database migration services. If you want to, um, you know, there's that bridge time when you're paying uh, to get that data over. Um, so the AWS database migration service is now free when you're going to Aurora, DynamoDB, and Redshift for six months. You can also still use this service to get, you know, as uh, Richard said, if you got, you know, stuff that doesn't even belong in one of these databases, put it in S3, much cheaper tier. Uh, finally, another, you know, again, to help bridge, if you're building, or bringing over to AWS a significant Windows or SQL Server workload, um, there's, uh, you know, that migration time is, can be uh, a crunch point in your budget. Um, so we would like to help you get to there faster, get up to the cloud, and realize the benefits there sooner. So we have, um, for these significant workloads, we have a program called Rethink for Windows. It's a credit program we offer. So we look at your that new significant workload and offer you um, a, a nice sized chunk of credits, um, equivalent to um, uh, a minimum of uh, probably in the 10 to 15 percent range of your annual run rate um, after you get the workload up there. It's a flexible credit. A lot of people start with that, and then maybe as they bring a couple of these workloads over and want to do a more um, expansive uh, uh, migration to the cloud, to AWS, will then work with us on our migration acceleration program and do a, a full all-in migration. So this is a great way if you have, uh, you should talk to your, you know, if you have some of these um, new workloads that you either want to bring over or build new in the cloud, uh, talk to your account manager, um, again, or you just email us at Microsoft at, at Amazon.com. So just to summarize, we talked about a lot of different ways in the last hour of how to optimize your licensing spend, whether it's combining, like Richard went through across your architecture, the BYOL and license included. Designing for the future has to be a key component of this as well and get your applications modernized and more efficient. And then finally, I just covered those three different programs that can further help you to optimize. Um, we have uh, another, uh, on the, sorry, skipping ahead here myself, um, lots of resources there. Um, I've talk, talk, talked to you a number of times about the Microsoft at Amazon.com. Uh, we're very responsive. I'm pretty sure Lance never goes to sleep. <laughs> he answers questions there rapidly as well as we've got uh, a, a lot of our solution architects help us. It's like our little chat line. Uh, so definitely use those. I've sent you know, had a few links here to pricing pages. Don't forget the demo if you want to start, you know, before you do that first time of importing images and uh, um, creating a dedicated host, go through and watch that. Um, we've got uh, on my clock here, 11 and a half minutes where we can take um, questions. There's microphones or uh, just shout them out. Did we, I see a question over here? Yes, please. So the, this question is for Richard, and the question was, how big is your team to support 100,000 databases? I'm doing that with six, uh, 60 people, too. 60 people, but this is a, uh, so we were talking about this over lunch, it's a 24-hour operation, yeah, right? It's yeah. a SaaS it's service. Scattered across shifts and days, yep, yep. 
Any other questions? Yes. Oh, there's a microphone there. Sure. Sorry, probably going to be super squeaky. Um, so I guess my question would resolve around, so obviously like Azure is known for being able to move your Microsoft licensing, right, with H, you know, hybrid use benefit. It seems like y'all have like for like just about being able to transfer with SA. Um, I mean, is that true? Am I missing anything? Because <clears throat> otherwise it seems highly competitive. Yeah, Lance, do you want to take this one? You get this one a lot. Yeah, when it comes to bringing licenses that are eligible for license mobility, mm -hmm. the benefits are exactly the same. Sweet. Uh, some of those benefits can change for products that are not eligible for license mobility, like MSDN mm -hmm. or Windows Server. So Azure does have different rules around those products, but for the products that are license mobility eligible, exactly the same use rights. Sweet, awesome, thanks. Sure. Thank you. So you guys have uh, mentioned MSDN a couple of times, and we're looking at this as a solution to start with for developers. Mm -hmm. um, what does that look like from a licensing perspective for our de you know, development workloads? Yeah. Go ahead, Lance. So using MSDN for your non-production and development workloads, those licenses are going to be brought to dedicated instances or dedicated hosts. Most of our customers would choose dedicated instances because of the freedom it gives a developer to change instance sizes, to turn those instances off when they go home over the weekend, and so forth. So both options are available, um, but dedicated instances are typically the preferred model. Um, an additional advantage is that uh, MSDN, bringing that to a dedicated instance, would allow you to bring Windows to that dedicated instance because MSDN is a user-based license. So unlike bringing Windows Server, you, you do not need to count sockets and cores, you're counting MSDN subscriptions. So I would recommend MSDN on dedicated instances, and we have many customers doing that today. Excellent. Did you Thank have you. a follow-up question? We'll, we'll give you a second. No, that was, uh, that's exactly what I need to know. Uh, is that a true across the whole stack or just in the SQL world, I guess? There's customer, you know, MSDN has pretty much every product under the sun you develop with, so uh, many customers, SQL obviously, but uh, many different solutions that customers are using MSDN for. Anything they're developing on. Um, obviously, Visual Studio is included in there, along with everything else you pretty much need to develop. Great, thanks. Got it. More questions? Uh, partner network licensing. So, those licenses, if you look into the partner network language, it only mentions on-premises. So those licenses actually cannot be brought to any environment outside of on-prem based on the language that Microsoft gives us. Very, very common question there. Okay, any other final questions? If you want to talk to us one-on-one, uh, -on -one, we're happy to do that. Um, I believe that you will get surveys. This is our first time presenting at reInvent, so we'd love your generous surveys, and uh, especially if you enjoyed your lunch. If you didn't, then don't tell us. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for coming, and thank you for being our customer.